my name is Christy Billock and I'm a professor and the founding program director of Keck Graduate Institute's Developing Occupational Therapy Doctorate Program. We are living in unprecedented times. This pandemic has turned all of our lives upside down. And as healthcare workers and providers, you are on the front lines. So over the next 30 minutes, what we're going to do is to discuss some strategies of how you can build some stress resilience through this very challenging time. Several different perspectives are informing what I'll be talking about today. Um, certainly occupational therapy informs it, lifestyle medicine as well. And then we'll be coming from a, a place of promoting mental health. So how can we prevent and promote our, our own mental health in our everyday lives. So our objectives for the day, in the context of these complex times, how can we better understand the stress response and how it helps us and at times can harm us as well? We're gonna explore strategies on how to build stress resilience. And then at the end, we'll talk about some ways to set goals and really make tangible the principles that we talk about. So some of the personal goals that you might have through this pandemic, and just as, as we began, just starting to think about what life is looking like for you on a daily basis. The number one thing is that you need to prevent or promote your mental health and protect your mental health through this time. You are, again, on the front lines and you're being exposed possibly to this virus. Um, and there's physical exposure, but there's also a lot of emotional impact of the work that you're doing. So I hopefully can give you some strategies today that you can try out and figure out what works for you to really help prevent burnout, hopefully long-term, and find ways to really practice self-care in, in a way that personally feels helpful to you. So here's a big question, is stress bad for you? And I think stress has gotten a bad rap, and a lot of people think, oh yeah, you think stress, you think bad, but stress is not actually bad for you, um, but it can be bad for you. So one thing we need to know about our brain is its primary goal is safety. Our brain is there to help keep us safe. Um, it cares about any threats that might be in the environment. It, there's, and when a threat is detected, there's a hypervigilance around that threat. So what we know right now is that in our world, there is a credible threat, and that is this novel coronavirus that is making so many people sick. So our brains are trying to help us in giving us these big stress responses to the threat that's in our environment. And we know that there's an emotional piece to that with the amygdala. Um, and then what the actual re re uh, stress response is, is our autonomic nervous system doing what it knows best, and that is to keep us safe. So our sympathetic nervous system gives us a big adrenaline dump when there is an acute stressor in our environment. Um, and then longer term, we have the HPA access that keeps pumping cortisol into our, into our system to help us meet the demands that are in the environment. So the opposite of the stress response is your relaxation response. This is your parasympathetic response. This is what helps you rest and digest. And a way that we can define stress then, stress is just this gap between the demands we have in our environment and our capacity to meet those demands. And as the demands get greater, if our capacity can't meet those de demands, there's gonna be more space in between, we're gonna have more stress. So we know what some of the negative functions of stress are. Um, and the number one thing that I think a lot of us are feeling right now is anxiety. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of anxiousness about what's happening, about the uncertainty in our world. Um, we're fearful for our own health, we're feel fearful for the health of people all over the world. Um, and the, the problem with feeling anxious all the time is it, in the long term, can lead to burnout. 
this is the thing that makes us sick long term. So some of the positive functions of stress is that stress can actually help us grow. It helps us get work done. It can help bring meaning to our lives. It gives us that, that, that really helpful motivation. Um, and one thing that is just vitally important to us right now is thinking about our immunity and actually moderate levels of stress increase our immunity. So we want some stress and some stress is, is, help, is helpful to us and is healthy for us. So there are some different ways to think about stress and the work of Kelly McGonigal at Stanford um, offers a different perspective. So she's a social, social psychologist and has really been doing some good work about trying to think about stress as being helpful for us. Um, there's a great TED talk um, that she did in 2014 if you wanna check that out. Well, this quote is from her. When you choose to view your stress response as helpful, you create the biology of courage. And I don't know about you, but I feel like really what we all need right now is courage and you as healthcare workers need it even more. So when we think about our stress response and our relaxation response, really what's needed is balance between the two. And we can think about when we get really stressed out, we're having an upregulation of that stress response. And when we find ways to relax, we are down regulating that stress response. And what we need in our lives on a daily, ba uh, daily basis is this balance between stress and recovery stress and recovery. Um, so the question becomes, how do we then build some stress resilience so we are more seamlessly moving between those states of feeling stressed and then being able to recover from them? So a way to define resilience is just, resilience is our ability to adapt to changes in our environment. And what, we are called to do right now is to make a lot of quick adaptations because life as we know it is no longer normal. I am an occupational therapist. I'm an occupational therapy professor. And I think something really helpful from our field is, is this notion called occupational self-reflection. So when we use the term occupation, we're not, we're not meaning the job that you do every day, but occupations refer to just those daily meaningful activities that you do. So when we get reflective, when we start paying attention to how we are experiencing our daily life, it really is a way to give us some power around the experiences that we, that we draw out of the work that we have to do, all the daily activities, the interactions that we're doing throughout our day. So occupational self-reflection is a tool where we can just pay attention, reflect on, and get intentional about the activities that we do every day. So in this webinar, I'm gonna be giving you lots and lots of suggestions of things that you can try. And at the end of the day, what really matters is what works for you. And so you don't have to try everything I am suggesting, but hopefully there are some things that when you, when you pay attention to your own experience, you can think, okay, I think that, might, that, that piece really might be helpful to me. So an, a really important place to start here is to focus on the things that you can control. And right now in our world, there are so many things that we can't control. And there's so many things that we wish we could change, but we don't have the power to change. So what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis is to focus on the things that we can control. We can control our actions. We can control our responses to things. We can control thoughts. And each of you could make a unique list of the things that when you look at your experiences throughout the day, these are the things that you can control. You can wash your hands. <laughs> You can uh, choose to do something fun with your family. When we feel like we are in control, it, it, it's, it really 
helps to decrease the, the ambiguity in our environment. And when things are unpredictable, it increases our anxiety. So focus on the things that you can control. And this might be something just very practical, like saying, okay, at the beginning of the day, I'm gonna list five things that I can control during the day. Or it might be just pausing. And in the midst of, of seeing patients or in the midst of tasks that you have to get done at work, you might say, okay, these are three things that I can control in this situation. So really important to that con control, a critical piece of it is being able to establish a daily routine. And we know that our brains love to know what's going to happen next. This is a just a basic part of being human and anxiety really thrives in the unknown so when we establish a routine when we create some habits ar around how we're caring for ourselves this can really help decrease those levels of stress so an important part of establishing a routine is the self-care tasks that you do on a daily basis and here we can think about how important it is to get out of bed and to get a shower, to get clothes on. This is what normal life typically looks like. And for those days that you are at home as we shelter in place, we are not doing things in a normal way around our self-care. So really, it's those self-care tasks that really give us this solid foundation of predictability in our day. And it's important to do those as normally as possible, even through this time that is just incredibly disrupted. Another really important part of, of self-care is the self-care we do around our mental health. And for you as, as healthcare providers, just finding those moments in your day where you can practice self-care can be really really impactful and it might you don't need to take 20 minutes out to do a meditation or something it can just be you know a minute between patients or between tasks that you need to get done but finding those moments in your day those little snippets where you where you get reflective where you get intentional about how you're caring for yourself this is this is really important work so one thing that you want to really make sure you're getting in your day is this activation of the relaxation response. So again, when we get, when we get stressors, or we have these responses to these stressors in our environment, we are up regulating our stress response. And we need to find ways to down regulate that throughout our day. So one of the best ways to activate your relaxation response, that parasympathetic response is through deep breathing. So here you really wanna think about your posture, about getting breath in, and, and we talk about deep belly breathing is, is, is kind of the most effective way to, to have that reset on our, our uh, sympathetic nervous system. So, when we are really stressed, what we know, what that feels like when, we, when we're having that sympathetic response is our heart rate increases, our hands might feel clammy, our chest might feel tight, our muscles uh, tense up. And to counter that, what we can do is take some deep breaths. And what the research indicates is that a good target is to take six breaths in a minute. So if you inhale for five seconds, and exhale for five seconds, um, that will put you at that respiration rate that is really helpful to reset your parasympathetic nervous system. They found that if you can even exhale longer than you inhale, that will have even a more tangible effect. So inhale for four, exhale for six. And again, you can do this just for a minute or for two minutes and see how your body responds because what's really important here is that you learn to feel and recognize what stress feels like in your body right another strategy is called the four seven eight breath so you breathe in for four you hold it for seven and then you exhale through your mouth for a count of eight and you can do that just three to five times see how you feel 
Another really helpful practice is mindfulness. And you've probably heard about mindfulness before. And some of you might think, well, I am not a meditator. This is not something that, that, that I'm into. Um, but I want to tell you, um, there's a lot of, of science and research behind this. And even if you think, well, I'm not a person that likes to meditate, what we know right now is we have so much vying for our attention. And in your work environment, that is nonstop. And, and a lot of these things are scary to us, right? And again, when a threat is detected, our stress response is going to trigger. So you can think about mindfulness as actually attentional training exercises. These are exercises for your brain. These are exercises for your mental health. So mindfulness de defined is just paying attention to the present moment. Um, it's noticing things. Um, and it's, it might be just getting, getting to the place where you can recognize when your stress levels are going up. Um, there are lots and lots of apps out there that can be helpful. Um, things like the Insight Timer, 10% Happier, Headspace, um, the Waking Up app. And a lot of the companies that, that offer these are, are, are offering up uh, their, their product for free for healthcare workers right now. So look into that. Know that that can be a tremendous resource to you right now. In the research, one of the most effective uh, ways to practice mindfulness is with what's called a loving kindness meditation. And this is where you are just, just wishing others, uh, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be free from worry, may you know love. It's also called a meta uh, meditation. Um, so look especially for those loving kindness meditations. You can send that loving kindness to yourself, to others. What we know right now is a lot of compassion is needed to, to do the work that you're doing in healthcare. And this can be a way to remind yourself of the importance, the value of the work that you're doing, and also give you a cue to give that loving kindness, give that compassion to yourself through the challenging days that you're, that you're working. So lots of different ways, explore those. Um, you could just take you know, a minute to focus on your senses. What do I see in my environment right now? What do I hear in my environment? How does my body feel? So another really important part of mental hygiene is, is really paying attention and setting some boundaries around the news and social media that we're taking in. It is really, really important right now to stay informed, but there's a very fine balance between staying informed and getting too much of it and, and feeling overwhelmed and having our stress response upregulate. So set some boundaries around the news that you're taking in. Um, and it's probably a good idea to not take in that news right before you go to sleep at night because that can disrupt your sleep. Um, you really want to think about maybe setting a number, the number of times that you would check in to the news each day. And maybe you say, okay, I'm only gonna look at the news twice today. And what we know is that the news is always gonna be there, <laughs> okay? Um, you don't have to feel like you're necessarily gonna miss out on everything if, if you don't check it often. But just know every time you do, it can just really amplify the anxiety that you might be feeling. Worry in moderation, you might say, what? You know, this is, this is about building resilience. How, how can you say that I can worry, you know? It, it can be really helpful actually to just get your worries out on a piece of paper or typed into your, into your, your smartphone. Because in our minds, when we are really, when we are responding to stressors, the brain wants to keep our focus on that, right? When you can write something down and say, okay, and, and, and devote some time specifically to getting those worries out, um, you're telling the brain that you recognize that there is a threat, okay? It's validating those feelings, but it's also saying, look, I recognize this. It's on this piece of paper. I don't you have to think about it all the time, right? So worry in moderation. Give yourself 10 minutes, 15 minutes to say, okay, this is my worry time, but now I can close that up and go and 
do the things that I need to get done in my day and maybe laugh a little bit or connect with others. So you wanna do those activities that are gonna bring you some positive emotions. It's really important to laugh right now. It's distraction is really, really helpful. At this point, I know we're likely because we have this abundance of, of or this perceived abundance of time. I, I know that I'm saying, okay, everyone says they have this so much time, but I feel like I'm still really, really busy. But we aren't commuting as much. Um, and we're, some of us are watching TV more than we used to. We're on our screens. And I would really encourage you to find those things that make you laugh, that, that bring some levity, or that you just, you're passionate about. Do those things that make you feel positive. Um, do the things that make you feel like you can experience love and kindness and all of those things. Because those positive emotions, again, are really, really valuable to what's happening in our nervous systems. Start a gratitude practice. There is a tremendous amount of research around this. And you might think, oh, gratitude, that sounds really like fluffy, right? Um, the thing is, is it's very warm and fuzzy, but it's also incredibly powerful. And so there's research out there that says, if you can just um, name three good things every day or make a list um, every night of three to five things that you're grateful for that happened in your day, that over a fairly short amount of time, you're gonna feel more happiness. Your well-being is going to improve. So start a gratitude practice. It might be something that you do with your family where you name the things that you're grateful for. Um, but gratitude can be a really powerful tool to mitigate some of the stressors that, that you're under. Something that goes hand in hand with gratitude is, is to look for the silver linings of things. I know that all the disruptions that we're feeling feel really bad, but I don't know about you, but I'm finding that there are some gifts in the midst of it, right? There are some silver linings in these dark clouds, things like spending more time with family, connecting more often with family that's, that's away from us. Um, you might find in your work that you are having connections with patients at a deeper level than normal. So make it a mental practice to look for the silver linings in the midst of the really hard days that we're living right now. Connecting with others is another wonderful way to promote our mental health and connection doesn't look the same as it used to right now. And we're missing out on those things of, of being able to, to have these informal connections with, with um, colleagues. Um, we're not picking up our coffee from the normal barista maybe every day. Um, and that is definitely a loss, but we can find new ways to connect with others. And likely, as a healthcare provider, you are finding really, really meaningful ways to connect with your patients right now. Um, so get intentional to make sure that you are connecting, even though it's not in the ways that we are used to. Luckily for you, um, every day in your work, you are providing really important care for other people. And what we know from the research is that when we care for others, it really helps to decrease um, our stress and improve mental health. So recognizing that there's so much pro-social work that you're doing right now to help not just the people right in front of you, but um, us as, as humankind <laughs> across this planet, um, and just really getting into the practice of reframing that purpose can be helpful to cope with the day-to-day -day stressors that you're, that you're under. Moving our bodies, this is like the magic pill for mental health. Um, and what's rough right now is if we are sheltering in place, we are probably not moving as much as, as we used to. And it's a time when we actually probably need to move even more than we normally do. So a good target is to think about 30 minutes a day. So in the research, um, the agreed upon amount is about 150 minutes of moderate activity per week um, is the recommendation. And so, uh, Low uh, or light activity is defined as an activity that you could sing through. Moderate activity, you can't sing anymore, but you can talk through it. 
And then high intensity activity, you can't even really talk through doing that. So 150 minutes of moderate activity, this is a good target. And again, we're having to get creative about this. Um, so maybe you can't go to the gym anymore, but you know, what are some resources online? Um, yoga can be a really wonderful way to move your body and to promote your mental health at the same time. Um, and there are great classes online. You might find that you could you know, get in contact with some friends and you all take a class online together, but just find ways to move your body every day. Another really helpful thing is to go outside. When we are worried about things, when we are stressed out, our brain likes to do something called rumination. And we just keep thinking and thinking and thinking about the same thing. And it can feel like we're getting stuck inside of our heads. But when you step outside, look up at that sky and recognize, oh, there, there is a perspective that's bigger than what's happening in my head right now. We know that sunlight helps in the release of serotonin, which is very helpful for mood. Um, and that in turn helps uh, with the release of melatonin later in the day, and that will help us sleep better. So get some time outside every day as much as you can. And if you're working, it might be if you can, you know, if you could step away just for a few minutes and just be outside, get some sunlight, take some deep breaths, and then come back into your work, you might find that to be really helpful. Eating healthy is really important right now. All these things that we're talking about help to improve immunity. And food is definitely a big part of it. So we might feel like we really want to comfort eat right now, but usually um, we don't find that our carrot kale salads are as comforting as a pan of mac and cheese or that piece of chocolate cake. But what our brains really need right now and our bodies really need right now are just healthy foods. I really like Michael Pollan's food rules, which the, the, the very simplest idea here is that you want to eat real foods. So that means whole foods, not things that come in boxes, not all the processed stuff. So eat, eat real food. Uh, mostly plants and not too much. Um, also, you really want to think about limiting sugar right now because sugar really spikes our energy up and then drops it, which can help us or can be harmful for us um, in that it makes us can make us feel like our stress levels are much higher. And um, caffeine is another thing that you want to be careful about. Um, caffeine can can make you feel anxious. So if you have any levels of anxiety right now, which most of us do, you might notice that usually if you drink you know, two cups of coffee, you don't necessarily feel more anxious, but right now you might be feeling a little more anxious from that. And that's because of caffeine's effects on anxiety. So you wanna be careful about how much you're taking in. Same goes with alcohol. You, you know, Some is okay, but just pay attention to how much you're taking in. Organize and clean your space. We know that when our environment feels organized, it can help us feel like we have some sense of internal organization and coherence on the inside. So this is a, a really nice place where we could exercise that control throughout our days. Setting goals can be really, really helpful. So there is a, something called the GI Joe fallacy um, and Lori, Santos and a colleague at Yale University came up with this. And G.I. Joe, at the end of his show, would say, well, knowing is half the battle. And actually, when it comes to health behavior change um, and our well-being, knowing is probably only more like 10% of this. And so I just have given you a whole bunch of suggestions about how to build stress resilience. But what it comes down to is you've got to make some choices and make some plans about how you're gonna practice some of these principles to really make a change in your life. So it's very helpful to set some goals for yourself. And it might be something as simple as just saying, you know, I will take a walk for 30 minutes every day this week. Um, what's great about having a goal is that it becomes a way to track your progress. And if you're like me, you love checking things off lists. So if you, if you write down that goal and you can give yourself a check at the end of each day, that can 
have a lot of reward in it. There are also some more formalized ways of setting goals that have apps that can be really helpful. One of those is whoop goals. So looking at your wish, your obstacle, the outcome, and then the plan that you're going to have to meet your goal. And then SMART goals also really help you hone in on being very specific and, and making sure that the goals that you have are relevant to your life. These are really challenging times. And it's important to say that if you need some additional help right now in coping with the difficulties that you're facing in your life, especially as a healthcare worker, it's a, it's a it's good to remember that you can reach out, that there are some hotlines, some warm lines where you can talk to someone about it, know that you're not alone here, know that there are some good telehealth options for mental health that are available that might feel really helpful to you right now. At my house, we made this sign and we have it hanging in our window. Um, my teenagers, my husband and I, made this and I just want to say thank you so much for all the work that you're doing healthcare workers um, again you are the heroes of this story and I just hope that you can find some ways through this really really challenging time to care for yourself and know that the rest of us deeply appreciate and value the work that you're doing so I just wish you well in the coming weeks and months during these uncertain times. Um, I hope that you can find ways to care for yourself, care for your mental health. Again, I've given you lots and lots of suggestions here. You don't have to do everything. Give yourself a, a break. Give yourself some self-compassion through this. Um, you're gonna have good days. You're gonna have bad days. That's totally, totally normal. But I hope that you can just find some time to check in with yourself and get intentional about how you're caring for your mental health through this time. Thank you.